Good morning, Facebook community. Christopher Ricker here, New York City Parks Environmental Educator here in the Greenbelt. And I want to welcome you all to our Greenbelt at Home virtual program. Today, we are going to be meeting with Greenbelt Nature Center Coordinator, Jessica Kratz, who is just buzzing about teaching you all about pollinators because it is pollinator week. And so I'm slowly meandering over from the Nature Center Trail over towards the Greenbelt Nature Center itself. And so if this is your first time joining us for Greenbelt at Home virtual program, we want to welcome you all. If you are a returning patron, either to our virtual programs or someone who physically comes here in person to hike our beautiful 35 miles of trails within the 2,800 acres of protected woodland that is the Greenbelt, welcome. And so again, we're super excited that we are moving into the summer season with both in-person programs becoming available along with continuing these really awesome virtual programs so that all of you can join us out here in our beautiful natural areas from the comfort of your own home, office, or wherever you may be on your mobile device. Without further ado, I'm going to flip this camera around to Jessica Kratz. Hello everyone, happy National Pollinator Week. And today we're gonna talk about bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, bats, and more things that are pollinators and help us out. Um, and first I'd like to acknowledge the land we're on. This land has been stewarded, cared for by, this is the ancestral land of the Lenape, the indigenous people who inhabited, cared for, and stewarded this island, which was known to them as Aquahaka, Madonkno. And what is a pollinator? Anything that helps carry pollen. Yeah, I know, when you define a word with a word, right? But what is pollen? A um, kind of a protein-rich powdery substance. So anything that helps carry it from the male part of the flower, which is the stamen, to the female part of the flower, which is stigma. Wind, like we have a little bit of a breeze right now, does that. Wind, water, um, some, some animals actually self-pollinate and kind of carry them themselves, of some flowers rather. And we're gonna to talk today about some of the animals that are helping us out with that. But why are we talking about that today? Because it's the designated week in June, which is pollinator week, back in the year 2007, the United States Senate unanimously, and that doesn't happen too much, approved the designation of a week in June as National Pollinator Week. And why was that necessary? Because people noticed that pollinators are declining. There's fewer of them. And why is that? Habitat loss, maybe use of pesticides, things of, of that nature. So now it's an international celebration promoting the valuable ecosystem services provided by bees, birds, butterflies, beetles, and more. And Pollinator Week is managed by Pollinator Partnerships. So, um, so it's going June 21st to June 27th this year. And the website is pollinator.org to learn more about Pollinator Week and check out some great resources. So we're gonna talk about some, uh, okay, so why else are pollinators important? About a third of our food supply exists because many fruits, vegetables, and seeds need pollinators. You know, that, that, that helps, you know, the plant didn't spread and grow. And fresh air, um, so a lot of our, our plants help stabilize our soils, clean out our air, supply oxygen, and support wildlife. And I think we might have a pollinator now. No, I actually didn't see anything. I was just moving over as you were talking, just so we can look at some of the plants that you were just discussing. And I think we do have a pollinator in there. I think if you look on this butterfly weed here, I do see something right there. Yeah, we got it. And there's another one behind it. So, so what are we looking at here, Jessica? We're looking at a ladybird beetle. Don't ask me, you know, which species it is. I can't exactly count the spots from here. But beetles, they're the largest order of insects, or Coleoptera, and there's lots and lots of them. And they play a very important part in the pollination process. I recently learned that there's a beetle that is greenish, called a cucumber beetle. Kind of looks like a green ladybug. And that is one of our pollinators as well. So speaking about pollinators that, um, that the Greenbelt is home to, 
And we might find, we might find an example in our, in, in this beautiful, um, in this beautiful, um, you know, landscape plan and wildlife area. Um, right. Area. Something we're looking at right here is that there's a ladybug just going through metamorphosis. Oh, wow. So kind of going through that transitional stage where you can see the new coloration and the new wings from its last stage. So that's pretty cool. And if you look over here, Chris, there's a... Got it? I'm trying to zero in on it. Okay, so we have something from the order Hymenoptera. We have a wasp. I know they might not always look to us to be the most pleasant thing, but they play an important role in pollination as well. Nice. And that looks like a paper wasp. Yeah, so we probably have some of their, their nests around the building. Uh, and, you know, the green belts, you know, we have a lot of wetland habitat. And right here, I have kind of a larger representative of, maybe we'll find some flies in our, but this is supposed to be our fly with some iridescent wings. It looks a little bit like a, a blue bottle, a, a blue fly to me, but, you know. So that represents our, our flies. And if you go to one of our, you know, our more wetland area, like Loose Stripe Swamp up at High Rock, or a little bit further kind of, you know, southeast here to Buttonbush Swamp, you'll find a plant called skunk cabbage. And flies are very important for the pollination of that. And actually that's one of the first things that kind of come out when we're in, in, in winter. So there's a purple spathe and the flies are very attracted to that. And um, butterflies, beetles and bees also help uh, pollinate our skunk cabbage. And another point about the overall benefit of our, um, our ecosystem services of our pollinator friends, um, our economy, right? Um, pollination by honeybees contributed over 19 billion to crop production in 2010, while other insect pollinators contributed nearly 10 billion. So, you know, I mean, if you want to put value as a price tag, our, our, our bees and our other pollinators are tremendously valuable. If we tried to replicate that by mechanical means, it would be very, very costly and challenging. And let's let Mother Nature do what Mother Nature does best. And speaking of bees, I get to wear a nice polydactyl puppet now, which is always exciting. There's over 20,000 species in the world, about 4,000 in North America. And I learned yesterday, thanks to uh, New York City Parks Department's Trivia Tuesday, there's about 200 bee, bee species in New York City. Of course, the most common ones that we're aware of, the honeybees, which is actually, um, you know, from Europe and kind of just, you know, became valuable and established itself here. And then, you know, we have some, some bumblebees and things. Um, but a lot of our bee species are solitary, but this bee right here is a great kind of representation of, of our like larger bees, our bumble, our carpenter. And we might have something now in here. We, you know, sometimes we find some different things. And, but if you look at the, this bee, it's very hairy. It kind of looks like our bumblebee. And the thing I, I like about the bumblebees here is that it has a buzz. And I, I only recently learned why it buzzes. Um, sonic pollination. So that buzzing actually helps loosen the pollen. And the bees are very efficient structures for, for collecting the pollen. They kind of have like a, they got like a saddlebags behind their legs. And ever eat Cheetos or Doritos and get your hands all covered in that? Um, in that kind of, um, in that kind of, uh, you know, let's see, that cheesy fuzz, right? That's kind of what it's like for the bee. There's so much, you know, structures and surfaces for the pollen to, to, to get captured and, and carried. Um, they also kind of, you know, they do sip a little bit. They kind of stick their tongue out, but <laughs> kind of like sometimes when your, your, your cat is sipping water. So um, the bees have very efficient structure that way um so they feed exclusively on our sugary nectar and our protein rich pollen many bee species are in decline in fact some species such as the rusty patched hump bumblebee are now considered endangered and like i was saying before habitat destruction disease um agricultural and lawn and garden practices used to pesticides habitat fragmentation Changes in land use, invasive species, and climate change are reasons. So, you know, we're going to love our bees. We're going to be kind to them, pun or no pun intended. And we'll talk about more ways we can do that later. But right now, I think I'm coming across something else we really like. I'll put the bee down for now. And um, 
over here, maybe we'll find something flying around, represents our butterfly. And butterflies, there are 17,500 known species in the world and about 750 species here in the United States. The vast majority of them, over 200 of them, are skippers. And sometimes we find that little brownish guy in here. And other types, um, blues and hair streaks. Um, and some, sometimes you have nymphalidae, um, morning cloaks, viceroys, monarchs, um, papillonidae, which is um, swallowtails, pyridae, which I see quite a bit here, the cabbage white, and I'm not sure if we saw some earlier, but I bet you by the time we wrap up, we're gonna see a nice cabbage white come by. And something else, uh, rodinidae, uh, metal marks. So butterflies like to perch on larger flower heads when they hunt nectar, collecting pollen on their legs and body as they search for food. Their surface area, oh, I think I see a cabbage white right now. Landing on some clover. And they're, um, you know, surface area, they're not going to collect it quite the way the bee does. They don't have all these structures and surface area. But what they do have is this kind of long sucking mouth part called a proboscis. So that's how they suck up the nester. It's kind of like drinking from a large straw. So they're very effective pollinators. And, um, okay, a little bit, you know, we have some, some tiger swallowtail here. This one kind of represents our monarch. Um, there's our cabbage white again. Scientific name Pyrrhus Rappe and um, Red Admiral. And so what do you have here? That doesn't look like an insect. But in some ways it does look a little bit familiar like our butterfly because it has a long sucking mouth part. It's a, it's a ruby throated hummingbird, the only species of hummingbird we have here in the Eastern United States. There are 26 species that um, pass through North America and 17 that breed here. But in the Eastern United States, we have the Eastern throated hummingbird and the hummingbird during migration season can fly like 18 to 22 hours a day, a really crazy amount. So that takes a lot of energy and so much energy in fact, that um, they can drink twice their body weight in, in, in nectar and things. So that's why we kind of, show you a little bit, we try to help them out a little while. Um, I don't think that's a pollinator per se, but we have a really cool looking spider and spider web right there. Probably some oh yeah, we can catch it. Yeah, an orchard or weaver. And even though this specific species may not be a pollinator, we have loads of different crab spiders and jumping spiders that actually act as pollinators as well, just by utilizing the flowers as a location to prey on other pollinators. So simply by sitting in one flower waiting for a bee or a moth or a beetle to come to lunch on, the jumping spider or the crab spider will move from flower to flower and in doing so inadvertently pollinate other flowers. And we did see a jumping spider here earlier today so we might, might see one of those as well. And right here is a bat. It kind of represents the type of bat we have on Staten Island, which is primarily um, the little brown bat. And our bats, we love our bats out here. If you notice, they're mammals, actually. They're the, like the only, you know, the flying mammals. Um, the, see the fur and everything? They eat a lot of mosquitoes. So they help us out. So they're not inherently pollinators per se, but there are, you know, the fruit bats. There are 300 species in the world of, of those and those are attracted to flowers they're more so in kind of warmer and tropical areas attracted to flowers that are, are are white or kind of brightly colored that are open at night and they have a nice fragrant nectar great example of that is cigarro that um you know the cactus and um the agave plant is dependent on, on bats for pollination, and you might know agave because it's made sweetener and also it, it's used in tequila. So our bats provide very, um, worldwide, provide very good ecosystem services. So we're gonna round this corner here and look at ways that we can help our, our pollinator friends. And this right here is a butterfly bush that later in the season will uh, will manifest a bit better and have some more things. And I think part of the reason our, oh, and we have a cabbage white here. Part of the reason our pollinators like this um, 
you know, I know it's towards the end of the season for it, but the Virginia Sweet Spire, it kind of has that long and tubular effect. When we have our, you know, our friends with long and tubular proboscis type things, you know, they like that. And speaking of something that, things that a, a hummingbird would like. Our hummingbird would like this flower, a native species here, cardinal flower. Um, so, nice long, long beak will go in there. So, of course, we're right here at the Greenbelt Nature Center on Rockland Avenue. So, even though we are at the gate of this beautiful 2,800 acres of woodlands and 35 miles of trail, we are still in the heart of Staten Island civilization. So, sometimes we're interrupted by sounds outside of our control. And even during that moment, we had a moment where our, our cabbage white just kind of stopped on our butterfly weed. So it's it's sort of, you know, we have, have both worlds at once here. If you go up into our, our nature center trail along there about a thousand feet in, you will have trumpeter vine, which is another kind of long sort of flowery thing that our, you know, our hummingbirds would like, you know, stick their long long beak in for, for nectar. Hummingbirds are not really attracted by scents so brightly colored things or something that they like. And as I was mentioning earlier, because they, um, you know, twice their body weights, something like this, um, four, this is a, a hummingbird feeder, um, four parts water to one part sugar, you know, mix it, boil it up, wait it for it to cool down, put it out, and you have to change it pretty regularly. Usually we do about two to three times a week when it's really warm. Um, that kind of gets, it doesn't take them away from their food. You know, it's not like junk food ruining them for the main course. It just gives them a little bit more nutrition to keep them going. And we have a dragonfly right here. I'm sorry, I don't see where it is. And that little branch straight ahead kind of. Oh uh, yeah, I don't know if you folks can see it at home. It's very well camouflaged. So in that dragonfly and multiple different dragonfly species tend to hang out in these hedges. Some of them are looking for prey because they will predate on mosquitoes and other small flying insects. But they too also inadvertently act as pollinators by perching on flowers and plants. Cool. So we got our feeder, right? So now our hummingbirds as pollinators now have some additional food. And then we have some other thing. What's this over here, Jessica? This is going to be a bee bath. A bee bath. So a spa day for our... Pollinators yeah, kind of, you know, helps them feed their young, kind of dilutes the pollen a little bit, cleans them up. And what you do is you take a plate. This is a coffee can lid because we tend to generate those here. Um, and you leave a little bit of a perch surface so they can stay completely out of the water when they're, you know, need to, to dry off and not be completely submerged in the water. So this is something you'll change the water daily and, um, you know, clean regularly, weekly, and this will help the bees along their, their journeys as well. Hmm, very cool. Is that why a lot of times you see during like the, the droughty days or weeks of summer, there might be some standing water around and there's always a lot of bees and wasps and butterflies hanging about. Is that like uh, the, the natural equivalent to this bee bath? I, I, I would say so. I, I know we have the option to make it a little whatever we want it to be sometimes we can make it a little prettier i mean if you want you can um raise it up by uh taking like a bottom of garden pot and paint that up and such right. but yeah we have the or you can sit on this cup too right that you brought as a perch yeah and while i'm at it i might as well water some things behind us <laughs> pretty much yeah nice. it gives a little more elevation very cool and i was as i was saying earlier another thing we can do is plants right here's my sunflower mask and i i know uh, i like to go to crescent beach on my days off sometime and look at look for sunflower look look for um look for pollinators look for butterflies in particular and they land a lot of times on the big sunflowers on your purple coneflower coreopsis so planting these beautiful 
wildflowers, these natives, these perennials that come back year after year are a really great way to support um, support our pollinators and um, Garden for Wildlife. I think the website is gardenforwildlife.org. So it's it's a good place to look for resources as you plant to plant. And here are some suggestions if you look in, you know. But of course, then depending on where you're watching this from, you want to look for things that work for your, um, you know, your kind of latitude and longitude, your hardiness zone, your, you know, moisture, sunshade, etc. So that's, you know, you look for conditions particular to your garden. And that's so important too to mention the the importance of native plant biodiversity and providing our pollinators with healthy native foods. Um, you know, a lot of time invasive species like garlic mustard, Japanese knotweed, stilt grass, things like that, um, because they become so prevalent and erase the biodiversity, they essentially become like fast food joints. You know, you drive down the New Jersey Turnpike or, you know, you're driving upstate New York and you see Arby's and McDonald's, but you're not getting, you know, your local taco stand, you know, or your uh, slider your food market. truck, your farmer's market, right? Absolutely. But thank you for mentioning biodiversity. I almost forgot there. Another thing we can do is record our biodiversity by um, taking photos, uploading it to the iNaturalist app, and um, you know, in, in particular projects right now, there is a 2021 pollinator part, pollinator week. Um, you know, that project that's gathering all the data on not just the you know pollinators we found, but some of the host plants. And, and sometimes, you know, getting those pictures of the invasives, you know, it's great when we can have volunteers come out and help remove them, but even getting a picture and documenting when and where these things were found help scientists over time learn more about patterns and help, you know, find programs to help, you know, with ecological restoration and things of that nature. So we're constantly learning and it takes all of us and the more we each contribute, the better, better things are. And I want to show a particular plant that somebody planted here that's going to help on our migratory journey. So we're just going to walk around and maybe, maybe we'll be lucky enough to see something great on the way. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. There was something that just flew that way, but we have another spider web. All right. So I was looking up at these little flute-like structures, and these can be found on the side of buildings all around Staten Island, and they belong to mud daubers, which are a parasitic wasp. And so they do act as pollinators, but what they also do is they create these tube chambers where they collect spiders and actually utilize the spider as a, a host and food source for their larvae. So again, all part of the, the food web and the ecosystem here at the Greenbelt. Speaking of larvae, I don't know if that's just the species or if I see an egg sac on that. Kind of hard to pick up. Let's see if we can get. Uh, so that's its abdomen. The light's reflecting off of it. So that's another orchard weaver. And another thing, I think we might have another wasp up here, so we're just going to walk a little caution. And um, if, especially if you're watching this in Staten Island in the New York City area, if you're interested in getting involved in a pollinator garden, there actually is a project on Saturday at Schmoll Park, which is on the border of Fresh Kills Park. We run by them on Saturday morning, the 26th, where they're doing a pollinator, um, you know, they're working on a pollinator garden, and then they'll do a special Thrive with Pride, make a natural tie-dye. So, you know, if you're in the area, you can check that out on, on the internet, and there's an Eventbrite registration for that. So there are established pollinator gardens throughout New York City parks as well as, you know, doing one on your own. So this is growing up kind of nice. I think we've had it for a few years now. Um, one of my colleagues planted some milkweed. And this is really great for our um, monarch butterflies to kind of stop and eat along their, um, along their migrations. So um, after they kind of pass through here, you know, like late summer, September or so, they'll be heading back down to, to Mexico. So that's a long journey. And um, here's an example of, you know, planting for wildlife that we've done here and at some points in the future hopefully we'll expand our, our native plant gardens like the one at High Rock and elsewhere in the Greenbelt to include more things that support our pollinators. Absolutely and it brings us back to what we were talking about about biodiversity right because monarchs specifically utilize milkweed 
You have beetles like the dog bane beetle that will only utilize dog bane, which is something very similar to milkweed. Um, so, you know, by having less biodiversity or by, like you mentioned, planting native plants, you're creating habitat and food for organisms that otherwise might disappear, right? Because of their specific niches. <laughs> Yeah, I know I, I'm, I'm kind of lucky in the world, as you might be able to tell. I'm not the pickiest of eaters, but I do have sympathy for something like the corner blue butterfly, which survives on the wild lupine. And I know about 20 years ago at Marine Park, I had the opportunity to plant that to help support that species. But it is important for us to understand the interaction between um, animals and some of their food sources and with climate change when you know, the, um, the like kind of the, the coming out of the food source or the animal, they don't line up. It, it becomes it's a little bit harder for that, uh, for that species to survival. And behind you, there's a really nice dragonfly on that branch. White tail. Skimmer, you see it? Mm-hmm. Very nice. Well, maybe we can check out the hedge one more time before we wrap it up and see if we can find any other pollinators. Again, if you're just joining us towards the, the tail end, this is our Green Belt at Home virtual program. We are celebrating Pollinators Week with Jessica Kratz, our Green Belt Nature Center coordinator. And we were learning all about the different pollinators that call this place home. We're learning a little bit about their interactions within the food web. And we're also meeting some of the awesome pollinators that call the green belt home. And there's our friend, the cabbage white again. Um, and, and that's interesting because that's a late season dandelion. And I'm kind of excited about that because that's a, a great early food source. And a lot of times people don't realize it. And if you just leave it, it gives a little bit more sustenance for our pollinators. I think I might see some calligrapher flying. Not that way. Oh, there's, there's one. And some of these things are so uh, tiny. Water singers do a little waggle dance too. <laughs> trying to tell us where that good pollen is. So, and again, this is the Greenbelt Nature Center at the corner of Rockland and Brielle. And so you're always welcome to come visit our facility and come along these front hedges and look for pollinators yourself. And Jessica Kratz is always inside. So if she's not, you know, coordinating something, managing a, an arts event. I might be um, taking a break out here looking for pollinators. And this sweet spire is in bloom most of the month of June, probably from like, you know, that first week up until you know, early summer here. So that's best time to see our pollinators that the good sun, oh, the dragonfly. The good sun is generally between 10 and 12, maybe between 10 and two. And that's your best chance of coming here to see. You or pollinators. pollinators. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> awesome, cool. Okay, well, um, you know, to find more of our great content, um, Check out our website, sigreenbelt.org. Um, our social media, we have Facebook at The Greenbelt Conservancy and Greenbelt Environmental Education. Our YouTube channels, which I think we have over 150 videos and growing now, is the, the Staten Island Greenbelts and Instagram, at Staten Island Greenbelt. Um, so yeah, definitely check us out virtually and if and when you can, Come, come and experience this in person because, you know, virtual will never do it full justice.